So um, uh, I thought we, you know, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the first time I met Jade and then I have a few questions and then I think we'll be happy to answer any questions from the audience if that makes sense. So, um, so I've been teaching at SVA since 2003, long, that's almost 20 years now. And uh, I met Jade in 2008, I believe. Right. And uh, so I usually teach the uh, second semester in the last semester of the second year of the graduate program. And so Jade shows up to my class and she has, she's shooting four by five. Uh, on location, and I'm like, wow, you know, I have, I just didn't really have that many students who were shooting, even back then, large format, and uh, and and um, as you see in the film, Jade is just like this little juggernaut of energy. She just goes out there, and is, and so anyway, right from the beginning, I felt like Jade had something, and I'm so uh, grateful. And, and delighted as a as a as a teacher, mentor, friend to uh, to see how all this came together. So I'm, I'm incredibly proud of Jade. Uh, just wanted to put that out there. And also, I would like to thank Philip for making such a beautiful movie. I mean, I'd seen it on, on my computer screen, Vimeo, but to the to experience it on the big screen with all the the sharpness and the color and the and the sound is just amazing. So you know, I just want to say um, congratulations to Philip and a just amazing job. Thank you. Okay, so uh, so Jade and I have stayed in contact over the many years. He was emailing me like, what do you think of this picture? Or uh, does this work? Or, you know, where can I get this scanned? And, and um, you know, Jade is, you know, you are relentless. And that's, a, you know, I think to to be a photographer, uh, to, to, to work on something for basically 15 years, uh, one has to have these kinds of uh, blinders to, to just go with what it is you want to do. And, 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 you know, things are going to affect you. Things are going to bring you down. Things are going to bring you up. But to have that kind of, it's not tunnel vision, but it's a kind of deep focus um, is so critical. And I think the, the, the film clearly shows that you have that. So anyway, I do have actual, some actual questions. Uh, so, and I think the, the first thing, we'll just deal with the title of the film, uh, Jade Doskow, Photographer of Lost Utopias, right? Right, yes. Yeah. So the project um, about the World's Fairs, but ultimately came to be known as Lost Utopias, because these sites really represent these past ideals in architecture and design. Mm -hmm. And so the film certainly directs, uh, directly relates to that. Mm -hmm. She leaned into and, the mic. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Um, and also I just wanted to mention how Philip and I first met. I was launching a fundraising campaign for the Lost Utopias book and I was really social media illiterate at that point. <laughs> so I had a friend who was a gallery director in charge of my Twitter feed. And she said, Jade, you know, this filmmaker sent you a direct message. And lo and behold, it was Philip, and thus began this long um, relationship with him accompanying me on these on these film shoots. And Philip, I want to ask you how. What did you? What, what got you intrigued, or how? What What was the spark there? Well, it was. Um, I, I always have to give a shout out to um, a colleague of mine, uh, Gary Hustwit, who's a great documentary filmmaker. Um, made a series of films, series of documentaries that began with a film called Helvetica. Um, okay, so that's no, a that film, movie, yeah, a film about a font, and that just opened my eye to like, oh, you could do that, you could do anything. Um, anyway, he had retweeted it and <laughs> retweeted Jade's uh, Kickstarter, you know, message or something on, and so I found that's how I found it. I immediately gravitated. I was immediately fascinated by it because um, I grew up absolutely adoring and intrigued by World's Fairs. My uh, parents had been to the '64. New York World's Fair. And when I was growing up as a kid, you know, when you're a kid, and I'm sure we could ask Benjamin this, you're in your room, sometimes there's books on a bookshelf, but they're just there. They're just always been there. And one of them was this gold souvenir book, gold colored mm -hmm. uh, souvenir book of the 64 World's Fair. And I would look at it over and over and over again. And uh, one time I was in Montreal and uh, went to visit the World's Fair site there where the Buckminster Fuller Dome is. And my only act of, uh, my only illegal act perhaps in my whole life was uh, I was compelled to crawl under the fence. Mm, it was nice. closed and abandoned Good. at that time and go into the dome. Um, so I just, I, bottom line is I grew up, my favorite movies 
well, I love documentaries, but I especially love the little documentaries you would see at an art museum and you go in, you sit in the little room and they show you a little 10 minute movie yeah. of the photographer, of the uh, art artist at work. Mm -hmm. There's one in particular about Noguchi that I particularly love. And I just always wanted to make a movie like that. And mm -hmm. I you know, discovered Jade and discovered this project and mm -hmm. was compelled to document her. It's nice to document someone else's creative process, yeah. you know, take you away from your own. Can, can, Jay, can you speak a little bit more about, because these things are uh, monuments of the, from the past, mm. correct? I mean, we can talk about the future in a second, but exactly. how, how does that speak to the present day? How does the past speak to the present mm. in, through these works of architecture? Sure. I mean, within the scope of all of the World's Fair sites that I was photographing, there was a clear break between World War II, um, pre-World War II and post-World War II. And the pre-World War II sites were often kind of looking backward on this premise of racist superiority. Um, so the architecture was often neoclassical in scope and there were human zoos um, to present people of non-Anglo cultures. Um, Post-World War II, we had the space race and this much more optimistic look and a more global look toward the future. Um, so from both, both centuries, we have these monuments that have been created um, to represent national superiority and, and forward looking architect architectural design. And ultimately, a lot of these sites have come to define certain cities, such as the Eiffel Tower, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what about the what, what's the future world fair? So will they continue? Is it going to become a virtual thing? Is it how, how do you forecast that? Certainly. And Charles, I remember back when I was working on this project, you gave me this wonderful book from 1996, The Digital World's Fair, um, which was thinking, uh, clearly, this doesn't have to be an actual in the real world event anymore. But they do still hold them. I attended a live World's Fair in 2015 in Milan. And leading up to it, there are all these issues. Um, apparently, the, the Italian planning authority wasted millions of dollars on infrastructure that didn't work out. So there are all these protests because the Italian economy was not very good at that time. And then more recently, there is a, a World's Fair just this past year in Dubai. And apparently, there were uh, workers' abuses and things like that. So mm -hmm. I don't think they have a real clear um, presence that makes sense in today's world. So it may be something that dies out in a sense? We shall find out. We shall find out. Okay. But people are very committed to them. There's a lot of people who are really, for the same reason that Olympics are appealing to a city or a country, it attracts a lot of funding to build infrastructure that does last um, into the far future. Okay. So let's talk about the photographs themselves. I mean, I love the scene in the, in the film where you get palpitations from that aerosol can that's yeah. touching the edge of the frame mm -hmm. which i completely can relate to because yes. working with the view camera it's all about absolutely deciding what's in the frame and what's not in the frame and how the how how, how things are close to the frame i mean it's 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 all about getting things as precisely lined up as you can and so that's very disturbing <laughs> but what is it is there is there something about the view camera that brings you great satisfaction and how do you think it was uh, uh, the right approach for this project and do you foresee uh, continuing this working way? Working Certainly. Um, well, I remember uh, Randy West, are you here? somewhere. So when I was in school here, I was just starting to photograph Red Hook Brooklyn um, with a smaller camera, Mamiya 7. And Randy West was one of my professors here. And he said, you can't photograph architecture with that camera. All your lines are crooked. And I said, oh my God, what am I doing? Um, so at that point, I went out and purchased a Wista field camera. And after my first year of school here, I went to Europe for a month with a few hundred sheets of film and basically taught myself large format work. And um, but a few things happened on that trip that I think made that uh, camera make sense. For one thing, photography and World's Fairs came up together. The first major mm -hmm. exhibitions of photography were, were at World's Fairs. And so I think for that reason, I kind of liked the energy of this 19th century early style of camera. But it's also really performative. And this is something I was thinking about a lot. Um, one of the early shoots was in the Parc de saint in Brussels, um, which is surrounded by the seat of the EU. So there's a lot of security there. 
And so there I was with my wooden camera and some Belgian police officers um, stopped next to me to profusely admire my camera in French. Mm -hmm. And so um, I realized it was kind of a license and it opens doors in a lot of ways that a smaller camera really doesn't. So that was certainly something that I think continues on. I mean, it, and it feels kind of magical going under the dark cloth and, and you know, interacting with the environment. At this point, I'm still working 50% digital, 50% large format. Um, mm -hmm. My current body of work is as the photographer in residence of Fresh Kills Park here in Staten Island. And it's a really unusual topography that I think only a large format uh, camera can really deal with. Great, great. Um, I, 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 I think that the, the word performative is perfect for the, <laughs> for the view camera because there's no hiding it. There's no, <laughs> it's not a spy camera. No. And in fact, it does, people are engaged. People are curious and it, it does give you license to do things that normally people wouldn't get to do. So yeah, I think it's funny. the first shoot we went on. I did the first shoot we went on. I didn't realize that part of, you know, that you put the cloth over you. And I was like, oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> it is very magician like. <laughs> yeah. So uh, here's another question about relating to specifically to photography. Uh, we'll get to the film in a second, but again, uh, just because we're, this is a photography program and about the idea of uh, when I met you in 2008, you had photographed that, um, I, what's the name of the place in, in Queens? In the, uh, the New York State Pavilion. The, the New York State Pavilion. Yeah. And then you, we see you in the movie also photographing it again. So do you, uh, how do you feel about shooting things over and over again? And would you go back even if you felt you'd made the best picture possible? Um, so the New York State Pavilion was such a great early site to, to work on because it's here in New York and I was here in New right. York. And during the span of this project, it went through its own transformation from abandoned to a group of volunteers in Queens raising money to um, make it structurally sound. So it's kind mm -hmm. of had this positive uh, transformation, mm -hmm. which has required, necessitated me to continue shooting, uh -huh. but the uh, photograph of the Buckminster Fuller Dome, mm -hmm. which has become probably the most well-known photograph of the whole project, I did take it upon myself to return to Montreal and you know, it was a failure, it was a flop. Couldn't redo right. it, couldn't, couldn't outdo so, myself. <laughs> right, can't outdo it, okay. interesting. Yeah, <laughs> no, that, but it, because that is, I, I, I actually encourage my students to, to revisit things because mm. I think there's a lot to be learned from, different kinds of light, different kinds of your own personal mood, something you read in the newspaper or some, something's, there's a bit of graffiti on the building now. I mean, things change. It's a dynamic world we're living in. And I think uh, that idea of going back and trying again is very, very important. So I, I yeah, think- Yeah, that being said though, because these fair sites are constantly transforming in terms right. of um, becoming renovated, transformed into a public attraction, it would be an infinite project, which is why I have kind of okay. finished it. <laughs> right. you know, I gotta say, I literally, literally just uh, last night returned from Seattle. I was visiting Seattle again. And because of COVID, for the past two years, that entire uh, center where the the uh, towers, the space Pacific Center? Science Center, uh, right where oh, the Space Needle, okay. Space Needle was open, but everything else was totally wow. uh, closed, abandoned. Yeah. It yeah. was weird. Yeah, oh, time to go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 probably open today. Yeah. Um, the dinosaurs another, were alone. Uh, one of the, you know, there's a couple. Of, so I love the way the film opens with Jade alone with the cars going by and this very busy environment and there you are very focused in your world with the cloth with the glass looking and that's a very solo and that you know there's something about that soloness that can be lonely but it can also be kind of exhilarating at the same time and then we see you also working with uh those helpers in uh in seattle and it's raining of course you know that's useful but is that um when you're working with other people is that is that a collaboration of any kind or are you clearly the captain of the ship and they're just doing you're just <laughs> i'm definitely just a captain. following orders yes <laughs> <laughs> definitely a captain but i will say i do like having people around i feel like it helps with energy um even in my current work at fresh kills i'm often with folks from the parks department and i like having um and also there's often things you can pick up from folks that are with you, um, especially in Seattle. I don't know Seattle that well. So right. having two locals was really, really instrumental in figuring out how to deal with the site. Um, so I would say I prefer having some assistance around often and 
you know, just helps keep up the morale. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think, and it's also, it's interesting kind of a trajectory for, I think, view camera photographers. When you start out, you want to take it all in your backpack. You want to go out on your own. You want to, and then as time goes on, you see that there's actually something very wonderful about working with, having other people around you, working together, being part of a team, getting energy from other people, getting ideas, inspirations. And so I think, uh, I think that's kind of a natural trajectory for it. Mm -hmm. uh, for photographic practice. Yeah. Um, so speaking of collaborations, I really want to talk about the movie because this is a really extraordinary uh, documentary to, to, you know, to make uh, this beautiful film about a young, living, working photographer. You know, that's, that's, yes. it doesn't happen all the time. And so to what degree is the film a collaboration with Jade or did you just wrap it up in a bow and <laughs> give it to her? Yeah, I pretty much wrapped it up in a, without the bow. We didn't, you know, I should really should have could have at least done a bow. I mean, um, yeah, how no. You, how, what was the back and forth between the two of you? Well, I mean, I know for one thing, Philip has much more footage than what you've seen. Oh, yeah. So, and it took a while. It was about 10 or 12 years of shooting, of, of Philip shooting. And was it that much? Yeah, it was about 10 or 12, but probably over the course of six or seven years, perhaps. Oh, yeah, okay, well, that, is, that is, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. that's not clear from the film. I mean, I'm just not that old. I don't even know how that's possible. <laughs> okay, so you worked on this film for But six it was years. over at least six years, yeah. Wow. You, actually, you see Benjamin grow up a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yes, it's true. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I would say, you know, it's, I think what's very interesting is, and I hope, I, I, be interested to hear your point of view. I, I was trained um, at uh, one of the first documentary places I worked at was a, a company called the Maisels, Maisel, and the Maisels yeah, Brothers, sure. yeah. two of the pioneers of documentary filmmaking, and kind of were among the generation, a small group of people, both in uh, Europe and the US that invented cinema verite right. or direct cinema, they called it. Um, and the, or what we might just think of as fly on the wall shooting. Right. So the whole thing is like, you know, just be in the background. So to that extent, I feel like I, I you know, we would, we would decide what days I was able to come out and film and what project it was. And then I really just wanted to just Absurd. let her do her work and, wow. and forget that I was wow. there. Yeah. yeah. And I was really surprised to see the final edit um, because especially as a woman photographer. I want to be known as a photographer, not as a mother, really. Mm. Um, now, whatever. It, you know, my son out. is older. It's not such a big deal either way. Um, but I was surprised because I thought, wow, is that how the editor, um, Anais, uh, sees me? Because that's not how I see myself. And I realized what might be perceived as maybe struggles or challenge in terms of having a career as a large format photographer and having a kid never it was hard but I always just committed to my work and whatever happened would happen so I would often bring the family on world's fair shoots and I would do my work so um so it was really interesting to see that final edit because at first I wasn't sure what to make of it um but then I realized well that is reality and I make my work and I have a kid and that's just what life is yeah I um yeah this is good I'm glad you mentioned I and I used to mention my editors and I used Michelle who's a young uh, amazing filmmaker as well and editor and she lives in Paris at the moment and um to the extent there's a collaboration it's very much between the director and the editor right. so that, that's a huge part of documentary filmmaking um I have often been the editor to other directors too, so I'm familiar with that process. Uh, and there's a there's a short, a beautiful short documentary about an artist um, called Rivers and Tides, which I highly recommend. It's about Andrew Goldsworthy, right? Who, who a sculptor who piles kind of stones on beside riverbeds and stuff. It's a magnificent film. And there's one moment in this film where it just follow you see him doing all his work. And this and I used and I watched a number of documentaries in this process for inspiration and just one moment where he went home and you just saw his family and then he went back to work. And I always thought, you know, that was really interesting. That was a really nice thing to get. So, so. so was that your idea to shoot Jade at, I think it's your mom's house or weekend house right, or that's my mom's, house, yeah. mom's house. Was that your idea? Yeah, well, I do, I do, you know, I also do biographies. Right. So uh, I think going to the house where, in a, uh, in a, <laughs> the house where Jade grew up um, was absolutely gonna be important. And her mother was amazing. And that scene is amazing. I mean, I feel like that's kind of the soul, the heart and soul of the mm -hmm. film is that moment. You know, you're not pinning up film on a clothesline. It's actually laundry. You know, you're making dinner with your mom yeah. and the, the kind of kind of revelation, but also then know how you edit it. Like you mentioned that you were hit, but you don't go into that. We just see nature. Yes. And I yes. love that. Like we're 
it kind of gives us space for our imagination. Can you talk a little bit more about yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned, you, you asked that. I mean, um, story, it's storytelling and a big part of a story is, you know, you want to get to the heart of, well, at least one of the hearts of the story, what's the thing? And the, you know, kind of the bramble or going into the, you know, just into nature and stuff like that it happens to be an archetypal, archetypal environment for that sort of thing. So you can use, we use pacing, we use um, cinematography, mise-en-scene, as we say, the framing. Yeah. Um, and we happen to have the context. And, and I must say, none of that, that was, none, none of that was planned. That we were going to talk about that. I'm not even sure how much I knew about your. Uh, I knew you'd had an accident, and that was one, a bike accident. But to, to for, that you had that pager and things like that. Yeah. Was really but you also different. you you shot it. And you gave the editor. Yes. The good stuff to work with. I mean, the editor was brilliant, but you also. Yeah. Figured out, or you know, you're just responding to the moment in a way yeah. to get the coverage that yeah. she can then put yeah. it all together. I must, it helps having been an editor largely by trade for decades, right. I find that I'm able to shoot with, uh, with I know what the editor right. wants. And I know what the editor will be mad if I don't come home with. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes. Certainly. Well, I- Thank you, though. Um, Thank you for that. Um, the the clothespin, I was gonna say that clothespin observation is very interesting. I wasn't thinking that consciously, yeah. but I like that. Yeah, no, because <laughs> you usually, know, in, yes. it's beautiful. usually in uh, documentaries about photographers, they're pinning up you know, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. pinning up prints or- Not the laundry, mayors, yeah. You know. I'm gonna tell people that was- <laughs> Intentional. <laughs> um, do you, uh, so uh, lastly, do you wanna talk, I know you're working on Fresh Kills, mm -hmm. and is that going to be another dozen years or so before- <laughs> I think that's um or how long Laura, has it been? Laura is here from Fresh Kills. Hi. <laughs> I think I think my proposal was to shoot for 10 or 20 years, yes. Um <laughs> because the, the master plan for the park development is quite lengthy. It's quite lengthy. I know yeah. it's like 50 years or 100 years. It has well, a long time. 2036. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um yes, yeah, so now a lot of these recent projects have really kind of dovetailed with each other. Um, so Lost Utopias, Lost Utopias was really about these grand architectural sites that fell from grace. So I think of it as a utopia to dystopia in a way. And then Fresh Kills is the inverse. It's um, 2,200 acres of New York City that was uh, the city's largest household waste uh, disposal. And now it's being transformed into a huge um, urban wilderness park. So a dystopia to utopia in a way. And um, so I really, again, I do, I would call it tunnel vision, tunnel vision to myself into this um, work and really committed to it. Um, and I think it really speaks to new concepts of wilderness and how we're interacting with our environment today. Okay, so good. We'll see you in about 10 years with the next uh... <laughs> That's beautiful. The opposite. <laughs> What's that? When do you start to film? Well, we, we have, I filmed a little bit. He's come out a few times. Oh, yes. I love it out there. Getting a jump start on this. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, actually, it is. It's it good is, to have long term plans. Yeah. yeah. I love that the opposite of falling from grace, yeah. rising to grace. Uh, yeah. That's very beautiful. It's a bookend. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Can you try some of the students about that place about Fresh Kills? Yeah. yeah, certainly. So Fresh Kills is located in the middle of Staten Island. And um, it's uh, so it's essentially comprised of these mounds, uh, kind of landforms that have been created out of what was there that are now turning into these undulating meadows and the waterways are, are starting to get cleaned up as well. So when you, I had barely been to Staten Island before I started this project. And, uh, you know, most of Staten Island is very, sprawly right there's strip malls everywhere and a lot of suburban housing and you get to fresh kills and it's just these open meadows with a huge sky uh, punctuated by methane pipes and other infrastructural elements so it's and, a really big mounds too right they're huge i mean the huge largest mounds. of them is 545 acres if you can picture that um so it's a really otherworldly place that feels completely out of new york city yet it's right in the middle of of staten island yeah yeah it's a, yeah you could you feel like you're in the midwest but yeah. you're actually in the middle of Staten Island. It's great. Um, well, um, I think we could open it up to some questions if, uh, if there's anyone who has any questions. Okay, there's a one back there. Yep. Do you want to stand up? Sure. We can see you. Hi. Yeah, hi, I'm Gabby. Um, I had a question. I When we were watching your film, I think something that really stood out to me was when you said like, 
can women have it all? Can we mm-hmm. have it all? And I think that that's just been something that's been at least on my mind a lot lately on whether there's certain sacrifices you have to make in terms of career or having a family and having both. And I just wanted to know if there's any advice that you have for like us female artists for balancing that that very difficult act. Yes, yeah, certainly. And um, I'll also say, you know, I feel like things are changing in such a positive direction these years that we're in, which is fantastic for all of us. And I've gotten all kinds of ridiculous advice over the years from male photographers, such as the one mentioned in the movie, you know, you're going to destroy your career if you have a child, blah, blah, blah. Um, I remember when my son was born, I watched a documentary about Marina Abramovich, and she said, if you have children, you have no art career. And that's that, right? So I thought, oh, come on, really? (laughs) Um, But I think right now the tides are turning. I mean, certainly if you look at the percentage of photography that that is not created by white men in a lot of the major institutions, it's ridiculous. It's very uneven. But finally, uh, a lot of the institutions are, are, are trying to catch up. Um, and my advice would be just be unapologetically yourself, whoever you are, you know, um, again, I'd bring my kid on my shoots, bring him to the openings. It's fine. And, um, you know, you just have to be really committed and not take a lot of breaks, no matter what you you constantly have to, regardless if you're a woman or, or whoever you are, you can't take breaks. You just have to constantly be thinking about your work. Yes. In your book, will you be able to put pictures of fresh pills from the board chart to uh, Meadows? Okay. Ah, to be uh, determined. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was I was asking before fresh kills turned to the meadows, will Jade be able to put pictures of what it was like? Yes, I most likely will have a few before pictures, yes. Go ahead, stand up and grab a mic. Okay, you're good. Thank you. Um I was just kind of thinking about the film in relationship to the photo series. And one of the things that I kept coming back to is that the Photos are obviously very much about places and the film is very much about the person behind the photos. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about how the two of you approach that either individually as artists or together as people collaborating on the film project, um, how, you know, your alternate focuses between like people versus spaces blended and where the overlaps came in. I mean, I think just logistically, we're both in New York. So a lot of the shooting ended up being around New York. Um, and then Seattle happened and we both, and Philip knows people in Seattle. So that just kind of worked out. And then I think through the editing process, process right? That's how the places of the film ended up being selected, right? I think, or are you asking yeah. about the choice of going, how, how much about the person and how much about the process? Yeah, and I think also just like a little bit about thematically, like making art about people versus making art about places are often like yeah. received differently. Uh, it's it's funny because I, uh, as a viewer, would love to see a film that included a lot more about other, you know, the World's Fair and the architecture and et cetera, et cetera, as well as in fact the the, the photo- photographic process. I mean, um, but. Um, what I'm really drawn to from as a filmmaker is the person. I think that's something you will, you know, you just never meet a lot. Right? How, how many times? There's many works of art I love. I have no, I couldn't, if I passed the artist on the street, I would have no idea who they were, let alone their life or some thoughts they may have had during the process. So I, I went more in, in, um, in that direction in this film. In, in longer length yeah. projects like I've done, I'm able to include a lot more. I may follow someone you might see more about the process. I, I know there's a lot, I would love to film, the, for instance, the whole printing process. I'm absolutely fascinated. And the work you do with Carl, and like there's so many aspects of, as many of you may know from doing it in person, of the photographic process that I absolutely love. So going forward, I'd love to photograph that more. But that's it. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, I just wanted to um, ask you, Jade, like um, publishing a book can be a pretty lonely and um, lots of self-doubt. So I, I didn't have advice that you can give like someone who want to publish a book. Yeah. 
Um, well, you have to do your homework like anything else. Research publishers look at what their specifics are, right? You don't want to bark up the wrong tree, so to speak. So if a publisher is making a lot of books on a, a specific topic like architecture or landscape, and that's what you're doing, then that would be a good publisher to pursue. Or if it's very New York City based, you know, there's certain publishers that really specialize in, in local kind of projects. Um, so I would say do your homework. And just like anything, you want to get to know people who know the publishers because they get so many cold calls. So just like anything, you want to try to network a lot after you do your homework to try to get people to give you the introduction. Thank you. I have a little kitten around sometimes. Yeah. And have a kitten, yes. <laughs> I have to say this is funny because often in my photographs, you know, there's no people, there's no kittens. And in the documentary, Philip was able to bring in babies and kittens, you know. <laughs> I just look. <laughs> somebody else. Anyone else? How about on the internet or on the uh, stream? Do we have or somebody? Oh, one more? Yes. I'm just a little bit curious because the uh, project took so long to do. It, it's next to the. I'm very curious about the funding. Yes, that's a great question. I'm not independently wealthy, by the way. Um, I had to do a lot of fundraising to do the project. It's one of the reasons I've kind of ended it because it was just logistically really challenging. Um, at one point, I sold one of my cameras to do a shoot. Uh, so um, I did a Kickstarter campaign in the beginning. So just kind of anything that I had to do to, to raise funds to travel and shoot, I would do. Um, so you have to be clever about it, um, sell work if you can, um, and yeah, try not to get too broke making your work, but I'm not good at speaking to that. <laughs> but you were all in. I mean, you were. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> and still, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and I think that, um, did was it just one Kickstarter campaign, but you had, did you have several, but you were hustling all kinds of, you were doing jobs and selling <laughs> prints and I mean, Jade, uh, uh, I mean, you did everything possible to to make the work. Yeah. Without having a lot of money. Correct. Basically. Yes. Yeah. 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 So. I want to piggyback on something. I was going to piggyback on basically your question, but also something you were talking about earlier. And it's really for the students. It's really for the students. My question, it's not really a question, it's just a comment. And then Jade can maybe comment on it. You were my student, so she mentioned that earlier. I remember in your thesis year, and this was probably in the fall, probably not until you got to Andrew, that I was very worried, and I wasn't your thesis teacher, but I was very worried that you were taking on this big project that was going to be too big for a thesis. How, how was you going to do that? How are you going to fly everywhere? She had this grand idea. It was just too much. And I was really worried that you wouldn't fulfill a thesis. Well, I was wrong because what happened, and I didn't know this at the time, that, and this is why I want students to hear this. It's, um, you know, you, you, your package of a thesis, if we look at it today, was just a fraction of what you've done since 2008. So I think it was admirable, but I also think you flew, the work you made during your thesis was so good that the committee didn't judge it the way I was judging it was, well, it's not a completed body of work. Well, the completed body of work wasn't going to happen. It probably still won't happen for another 20 years. I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of taking on more projects, but your, your lifelong is going to be about these issues and, and maybe not the world's fair, but you were, not, you were seeing this very far in the future at that time. Yes. So the, the point I'm trying to make, and, and I'll stop talking in a second, is that we do have many students like Jade that actually take on huge projects. And sometimes they're a video project, a filmmaker. Uh, and we're like, oh gosh, do you know how much work that is? Can you possibly make an hour and a half film? It's just, you don't, do you understand? Um, so we don't want to discourage that at all, like I did. Um, we just need, you need to figure out what can you do in, in a year of a thesis? What can you accomplish? and knowing that you're going to continue to work. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I find mm -hmm. that a lot of times true about, maybe both you can talk about this, I find that very true about our, our video makers, the people who are doing their documentaries or sometimes narratives too, that you can't cram mm -hmm. all this work into nine months or six months, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say when I was here attending the graduate program, I knew it was very finite, two years is really short. So I wanted to make the most of it. This was the project I came up with, so I had to make it all work. Um, doing a huge global large format project by, during thesis year might not be for everybody, but, but why not? <laughs> you didn't really have, unlike me, you didn't really have this idea that you were going to accomplish the big idea, the big, the big picture, which might take years and many, many pictures. I thought, you know, in my head, I was like, oh, well, you won't accomplish this in the given time of a, a graduate degree. And maybe I don't want to put words in your mouth, but maybe in your head it wasn't about that, or was you know did you see it differently than I was seeing it? Like, how are you going to finish this in six months? Yeah, I think I was thinking of it. I like I'm a list person, so I had compiled a list of 150 fair sites. So mm -hmm. that was my goal. See, and that was my fear. Like, <laughs> oh my god, 150 <laughs> sites between December and April. <laughs> so, but I think, you know, I did commit to traveling to Europe and photographing a lot of really key sites that represented the main ideas very accurately. Um, so to represent the key, many of the key components that were wrapped up in the project at that point did fit into the thesis year. Mm -hmm. So um, I think on a concept level, less than a list level, um, it did, you know, that's kind of what I was thinking. Okay. I, I remember, excuse me, I remember I'm, I'm sorry. I remember the summer before she began the thesis year, which as those who are going into thesis next year, this is the most important summer of your life, creative life anyway. And you got to make it work. You got to plan it out and use it. And she did. Uh, she made a point to travel to Belgium. I think you went to Belgium that summer and uh, other places. And this summer for the, some of you, going into next year's thesis project, it really is gonna count, so use it. I'm giving that lecture a little early. I think Adam, oh, another question here. Out of curiosity, how many world fairs did you go to and how many images did you shoot? Ah. Uh, um, before you got to the, the core group. I photographed all of the North American sites, which is about 25 sites and five sites in Europe. Um, so my list is not checked off completely. And I didn't shoot a huge quantity as if any of, I don't know if any of you are shooting film or a large format film, it's gotten exponentially more expensive and I'm a really slow photographer. So for each shoot, maybe I would shoot 20, 30 pictures a day at the most. Um, so one of the things also in response to what um, Andrew was talking about earlier, digital versus large format, if you're shooting a bunch of digital pictures and then you're waiting for everything to process, to me, it's the same amount of time in a way that you're investing as shooting 10 excellent pictures on film. Um, so in the end, I didn't shoot a huge quantity, maybe 800 pictures at the most in 10 years. So it's very yeah. selective. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to, and they sort of talked about this, Jade, but I, I would be interested, and especially for the students to maybe talk a little bit more about the sort of genesis of the project. And you talked about how you wanted to teach, you wanted to learn how to shoot large format. And was there a moment when you were in Europe photographing where it was like, okay, these are the world fairs. And also maybe where your interest in architecture and sort of these landscapes and these spaces sort of came from, was that something that happened at that moment or was that is that part of a maybe a longer standing interest in history and sure so the short answer to why the world's fair project was i was traveling with family in spain and portugal in 2003 and in seville uh, there's these tourist buses and the tourist bus took us to the 1992 world's fair site and the 1992 world's fair site is dramatically different from the old city of sevilla and you cross these bridges designed by Santiago Calatrava. It's very dramatic. And then you get to this huge site and there were 
empty flagpoles clanking in the wind and this uh, fountain full of beer cans and weeds. And I thought, this is what they're bringing the tourists to see. That's interesting. And uh, so it kind of lodged in my mind. And at that point, I was really invested in photographing um, my neighborhood in Brooklyn, Red Hook, which was just in the New York Times. I don't know if some of you saw the article, but we just published a really nice essay of 13 years of work. Um, so I was really thinking about architecture that has outlived its original intention. And so this World's Fair site was that in spades, really. Um, so that was in my mind. And then um, when I started at SVA a few years later, I was still kind of in the back of my mind. And as I was photographing architecture, I thought, well, this is such a meaty subject intellectually, right? It's about history. It's about design. It's about uh, public urban space, all these things that I find really exciting and interesting as a photographer. And so that's when I was able to kind of sink my teeth into it. And then in response to why architecture and landscape, now you've all seen where I grew up where my childhood was, <laughs> which is in a house that is from the 1600s or 1700s, we're not really sure, and six acres of wilderness. And so I've often thought, well, why am I attracted to these World's Fair sites and now to Fresh Kills, which are really these kind of imperfect mm. sites in one way or another. And growing up in a house like that, the history, is, uh, the history of the place is just constantly present. Um, when I was nine years old, we, had to, we added onto the house, and so they hacked through the back wall, and we could see the the stones held together with mud and, and horse hair, you know, so it's just the history is always living in a house like that. And, um, and then I'd spend a lot of time as a kid in the, in the woods. And then I would find the neighbor's house and their hunting perch, which I found really creepy and disturbing. So it was kind of this, this imposition upon the wilderness. So I think growing up in a place like that, just, you know, kind of built, built this innate a need for me to explore these unusual kind of spaces that really mix humans and overgrowth. Well, I think it's been a really remarkable evening. Um, I can't thank you enough, Philip, for making an amazing movie. Uh, we have a, a number of other photographers out there who I'm sure would uh, yeah <laughs> they may have when they, they'll be they will afford you their kickstarter uh, yes I uh, love, yeah. yeah and I wanted to thank um Charles and the MFA department so much yeah. for inviting us here for this evening it's really yeah. wonderful to be back here yeah. back here and and to share this with all of you and I want to just say congratulations Jade fantastic thank and, you and thank you everyone thank you Dave